There's a lot of new songs that have been written, and that's okay. I like new songs, but truth be known, I like the old songs better. I like the old traditional songs, and I'm not ashamed to say that, but that's not saying that I don't appreciate some of the newer songs. I just have my preference. A man by the name of Joseph Philbrick Webster, who lived in the 1800s, wrote this song. Composer of the music for Sweet By and By, he was born in Manchester, New Hampshire, and by teaching music, he earned enough money to make it through Pembroke Academy. At the age of 21 years old, he went to Boston for further studies. He had a fine, veritone voice and played the piano, organ, flute, melodeon, and violin. In 1843, he went to New York. I knew there was something about him I liked and sang on the concert stage until 1849 when a severe attack of bronchitis damaged his voice. It was in 1857 he moved with his wife and children to Eckhorn, Wisconsin, where he lived for the remainder of his life composing over a thousand ballads of which this is one. Sweet, by and by, if you know it, you can sing it with me, that'll be just fine. There's a land that is fairer than day And by faith we can see it afar For the Father waits over the way to prepare us a dwelling place there in the sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful shore in sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful shore we shall sing on that beautiful shore the Spirit shall sorrow no more. Not a sigh for the blessing of rest. In the sweet by and by, we shall meet. Sweet by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful shore <coughs> to our body. We shall meet on that. 
that beautiful shore in the sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful shore. Amen. Thank you. If you have your Bible, Mark chapter 10, Mark chapter 10. While you're turning, don't forget this evening, we'll be back in the uh, Lord's house ready for prayer at uh, 445. Let me say, Brother Chuck did call us, and the shot is working, and he's in Pennsylvania. And he said, I had to drive with uh, through rain the entire time, Brother Chris, but I'm all right. So you remember Brother Chuck as he's traveling. Let me say, uh, if you're in the military and you've served in the military, uh, I want to personally say I appreciate your service, and we appreciate all the men and women who are serving uh, in our military. And that's what tomorrow's about. These men and women who have given their life uh, to the, the service of our country. Amen? Amen? And it wouldn't bother me if we'd get a whole lot more patriotic in our country. Uh, I'm grateful for, uh, for what these uh, folk have done and how they've served uh, America uh, for our country. And many of that, tomorrow's not about uh, barbecuing or firing the grill up. I probably will fire it up. Uh, but it's not what it's about. It's about remembering those who give their lives that you and I may live in a free country. And uh, I want to say this morning I'm grateful for that. And I'm grateful that I was born in America and able to live in America. And I'm in a church tonight, this morning rather, uh, that I can come and serve God in spirit and in truth and not have to worry about not being in a, in a free country. You could be in a very socialistic country. You could be in a place uh, where you can't serve God without uh, great persecution. So I know many things that are transpiring uh, in our country today are heartbreaking. But God is still on the throne and it's still America. And we're still flying the flag and we're still in the Baptist church. And none of this has never, ever surprised the Lord. I want us to look this morning, uh, if, have you, if you already got your Bible, Mark chapter 10. And before we start reading... Uh, I want to ask a few questions about a few thoughts. In Mark chapter 10, we'll start in uh, verse 17 here in a moment. Uh, but when I was brought up as a child, I can remember, matter of fact, I was not brought up in a family where we went to church. If we did every now and then, it was something special with uh, my grandmother, my mom B. Uh, but I was brought up around men and women, and there was a, a, a saying a lot of times in our in our in my presence uh, that I guess I just picked up on and uh, I've said it myself and you're going to know exactly what I'm saying when I, when I say it and I just want to expose it this morning because it's not right to say. I can remember folk in my family and friends of our family that can remember said there's two things in this world that I can't stand or that I hate. Who can tell me what they are? Huh? Well, that's not what I'm aiming. Somebody said it. Uh-uh. And when they're referring to people, there's two kinds of people I can't stand in this world. Somebody said it right there, a liar, and then what else? A thief. How many of you have heard that growing up? Raise your hand. Spit that out of your vocabulary. Jesus loves them. Now, I'm, by no, I'm in no means condoning lying or stealing, but I'm exposing an attitude towards sinners this morning and how I want us to look how the Lord confronts sinners. And uh, we're living in a day and time, friend, our time is running out. What we're going to do with, with trying to reach people we've got to do now, used to, uh, we would... Uh, we would uh, go about trying to see folks saved. And I, I, I'll be honest with you, the older I get, the more I, I, I appreciate the verse, he that winneth souls is wise. 
Uh, it takes some tact and some diligence in studying to literally, and James said it this way, to convert a sinner from his ways, to turn one from sin. There is so much that's going on in the lives of individuals and people. Uh, yes, I know they're blind. I know they can't see without God doing something. But did you know what? God has always used man to reach man. God is using you and I to reach a lost and dying world. And I want to look uh, at an illustration this morning in the life of uh, the rich young ruler, if you have your Bible. Mark chapter 10, and we'll start in verse 17. And I don't know how far I'll get here. We will be back in the life of David tonight. Uh, but um, I don't know how far I'll get but I just want to share a thought with you that the Lord had shared with me. Notice verse 17. And when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I might inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There's none good but one, that is God. Now watch what he says here. Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Defraud not. Boy, young folk got to get a hold of this next one here. Honor thy father and mother. And he answered and said unto him, Master, well, what a statement here. All these have I observed from my youth. Now watch this next statement because here's where we're getting our thought from. Then Jesus beholding him. I want to stop there. This word here simply means that Christ just looked at him exactly like he was. In other words, Jesus didn't just look at him uh, to communicate with him, but he gazed upon him. He gazed on him and he saw some things in this man's life. He knew where this man was and he's going to try. His overall goal is to see this man saved. But I want you to know at the end of the story, this man walks away grieved and saddened because he's been confronted. Uh, but I thought about this. If Christ already knew what he was going to do, why did he confront him this way? Well, I believe there's an example here for you and I. Now watch what he says. Christ beholds him. He, he's looking at him exactly where this man's at. And by the way there, God knows where you are. God knows where I'm at. God knows where sinners are. And let me just tell you something. This man was already aware of what he needed more in life than anything. And nobody had to beat him over the head with a Bible to tell him. Nobody had to force something. I like ribeye steak. Matter of fact, I've got one at the house, Brother Marty. I'm going to have it. But I don't, how many of y'all like ribeye steak? Let me preach out this minute. I mean, if you had, uh, I don't like it shoved down my throat, though. Amen. I like to cut mine, chew on it a little bit, don't you, Brother Mark? This man knew his greatest need in life before Christ ever confronted him. Did you know what? You don't have to always try and convince everybody of everything you and I know and they're wrong and we're right. And I'm telling you, friend, I'm pastoring in a church that is affiliated with a denomination. We are fundamentalists. We are independent. And I thank God for that. Wouldn't change that for nothing in the world. But I'm telling you, we're hard as we can get. We're hard as stone. We know everything. We've crossed every T. We've dotted every I. We've got it right and everybody else is wrong. Some of y'all can get mad if you want. I'm just going to tell you how it is. That's the reputation that we've got. You know what? I know all of us are not that way. I know many of us don't feel that way. And I'm all for good, firm, solid preaching that exposes sin. Don't you misunderstand me. But I'm telling you one thing, friend. There comes a time when it's about a man's soul. You and I better be very tactful. I can illustrate a few things here. 
Jesus, when he beheld this man, I want you to notice, after this man communicates with the Lord and tells the Lord everything he has to tell him, Jesus looks at him, he's gazing on him, and he loved him. Read the Bible. I'm on Facebook and I know it and I just already done made my mind up. They may take us off here, but I'm going to tell you, uh, I've been listening to some good, solid preaching on Facebook. I mean some folk dealing with some issues. And if they take me off over this, they're going to have to take a pile of more good preachers. And I will thank God for them this morning. But let me tell you what I'm trying to get across on. I, I can remember of uh, being in a, a services or being around services, being around people to where Churches go out of their way to get lost people to the house of God. And let me commend you for that. God bless our churches that are trying to get lost people in. And pastors will get lost people in. And they'll, they'll have the house full. And then they'll have an evangelist in. I don't do that anymore. I can't trust. There ain't too many I can trust. I'll just be, I know I'm going to get in trouble. But I'll just be honest with you. There's only a handful of them that I, could, that I could put up in here that wouldn't open their mouth and make a mess out of things. Amen. Just say something totally unnecessary, look foolish, and speak before they ever think. You say, what are you talking about? Well, just hang on a minute and I'll tell you. I know of uh, places where these churches have went overboard and spent money to get lost people in the house of God. And then lost people come in the house of God and uh, they'll come in, they'll come in, they not dress like you and I, they don't, they don't fully dress. Uh, uh, young ladies will come in with a thigh uncovered which God says in the abomination in the book of Isaiah. Uh, men will come in with long hair, and they'll come in. And the first thing this rascal wants to do is start hollering about wearing flag, flop, uh, flag flops, referring to men being homosexual if they wear flip-flops. Well, I'll be honest with you, i got a pair at the house. There's a place for them, amen. I wear them at the house. But why would anybody totally just go out of the way to offend someone? And then they'll, then they'll get on this crack. Well, there's a bunch of hippies nowadays. Well, that guy that's got the long hair, he's cut you off. And he anything else you say, you can forget it. He's not going to listen to you. You can forget. I don't care. Well, that ain't how it was in the old time. Well, go back and study the old time. I never recall Dr. Robinson ever debilitating anyone like that. I mean, I've seen it in our, in our group. We'll get them in here. We'll work hard and get them in here. And I mean, buddy, you talking about just blasting them and raking them over the coal. Hey, I'm not, God's not in that. I didn't say there's not a time to confront someone over their sin. And I didn't say, well, I'll not preach on sin. But let me tell you something. These people are already lost. They're already on their way to a place called hell. Many of them know where they are. They're just looking, and many of them are searching. If you were in that situation and you found yourself in the house of God, what do you think? You might be looking for a change. But I'll tell you what, a lot of churches, friend, and preachers, and I don't want to be part of them, rip me out of your phone book, take me out of your camp, if this is your mentality of Christianity. This militant-style Christianity that wants to bang and beat on people to the point that you can't get them back to the house of God for nothing because they've been belittled and they've been uh, put down in a public place. I'm not in it. Now, does God say long hair? Is it right? He sure does. God says long hair is a shame unto a man. He ought not have long hair. It's in the Bible. Read it, okay? But that doesn't give me and you a right to get up and just totally rip somebody up and down and embarrass them in front of people and make them feel ashamed. Look here, God never told me to make people feel ashamed. That's the Holy Spirit of God's job. And if we'll quit trying to do it and try to win people to the Lord Jesus and see them saved and have some long suffering. Now here's our problem. Unlike Christ, we have a problem loving. I want to talk to you this morning on confronted by love. Father, we love you today. We need your help. And I want to pause and thank you one more time this side of Calvary for the men that loved my wretched soul. For the men that loved me with a Christ-like love. And it's not my goal or my job to get up and 
blast or belittle anyone who has a different style of preaching. But Lord, America, those that are lost in this world, they need to see wisdom in preaching. They need to see some folk that really love them and that are desire to see them saved. And I pray you would bless the word of God this morning in Jesus' name. I want to see how the Lord, how the Lord reacted to this man. First of all, to see what the Lord said, of see what the Lord said. Now you know God knows it's something that Christ uh, goes this far with this man because the Lord knew his heart. Jesus knew exactly what he was going to do and what he was going to say. And unlike the Lord, you and I don't know that. So that gives you and I more of a motive to approach things in a way of compassion. You know what? It's so easy to see other people when they're suffering. It's so other people easy to see other people when they're wrong. I mean, I'm telling you, man, uh, we've got a crowd, it seems like, or, or, or used to be and, and still is in a lot of ways. I've, I've cut ties. I've just quit going with some of these folks, these crowds, because look here. I mean, what are we doing to see people saved? What are we really doing? Uh, what are we doing to get them in the house of God? Here, here I can remember one place. We, we, we did everything we could get somebody in the house of God, and then somebody wants to come in and just go to blast them. I don't know about you, but that's not too appealing to me, is it to you? No. Just to blast someone over the way they dress, over the way they look, where they're at in their lifestyle, I'm not in it, and I personally don't believe God's in it. God doesn't need my help to bring a sinner to his or her knees. Now, God chooses to use us. He uses the Word of God, and I don't really recall anywhere in the Word of God. Now, I do know Paul said rebuke before all. I know that, and I'm not saying there's not a time that we don't need to rebuke people, but I'm primarily talking about a hobby horse that some folks get on and all they want to do is bang and beat people to death. And you know what? I'm just not in that. And I don't believe the Lord is. And I'm going to prove it to you this morning from this text. First thing I want to notice about this man is this. It's so easy for you and I to see other people's problems. Well, Christ saw his problem. Uh, this man had a special sin. And Jesus didn't go around and point it out to him. He waited and dealt with this man in a humble-like manner. Notice with me, if you would, in verse 20. Look in verse 20 and notice what he said. And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these have I observed. Now look, that word observe means he's been looking at this all of his life. Since I'm a youngster, I've been literally studying the law of God. Now, I will say this, the, the, uh, in that day, the priest and the, uh, the Sanhedrin they would, one would believe that the blessing of God was upon a man if he had a lot of wealth, okay? And so this rich young ruler was looked on as though God's blessing was on him, but in reality it wasn't because what this man had, listen to me, what this man had, these, this wealth that he had, these riches that he had, robbed him from the most important thing that ever would mean anything. Thing to him. This man said he, he had a special sin. Now what was it? I wrote a thought down. This man did not see himself as a condemned sinner. Here's what he did. One said this. He measured obedience by the external actions only. In other words, uh, wearing the right clothing, doing the right thing, going the right places. That was what you had to do to get to heaven. Everything was on external obedience to God. And that's what he said. He said, hey, look, all these things have I observed from my youth. I have looked at them. I've studied them. I've watched them. I've looked at the law. I've watched the law. And I've observed them. He didn't say I did them. But in a roundabout way, he was leading to the Lord that he had done all he could to keep the law. And you and I both know he didn't keep the law. What he was trying to tell us uh, is something that Paul was exposing in the book of Philippians. This man's basically telling the Lord, I have lived a blameless life. You're not going to be able to point the finger at me none. 
All these I've observed from my youth, is what he said. Look with me in the book of Philippians. In the book of Philippians, Paul, the apostle Paul, is, um, he is exposing the flesh. And he's talking much about the flesh, and he says this in verse 6. Notice it. He said, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, he's referring to himself, what he was and how he kept the law, if you will. Uh, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, watch this, blameless. In other words, there wasn't a whole lot, Paul said, you could point the finger at in his life. Well, this rich young ruler, friend, he is coming across with the same attitude. Look, I'm special. I've kept, I've observed all these things from my youth. Now stop it right there. Here he is with an independent fundamental Bible preaching Baptist preacher. No, you hat and you liar. Nobody can keep the law. That would have been the first response. Now, was he lying? Yes, he was. He hadn't kept the law. He didn't keep the law. But as soon as he said, all these things have I observed from my youth. Do you know the first thing Christ did? He loved him. Now, what do you mean? The word love there simply means this. This man was in a public area around other people, and the God of heaven revealed love publicly to this man for him where he was in his life. It didn't matter. Everyone knew what the man was saying. He hadn't kept the law, and I'll never forget it. John C. Maxwell, I'll probably get criticized for that, for quoting him, but that's okay. John C. Maxwell made a statement. He said, no one cares how much you know until they know how much you care. My, 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 what a statement. And if you've ever studied the life of John C. Maxwell, he got saved at a young age, and God has used that man mightily in America. Now, we don't agree with everything, but he has reached many, many people for the Lord and has a tremendous ministry. He's done much for the cause of Christ. Do you know how that man got saved? Does anyone know how he got saved? He was in a Sunday school class with a small number. Uh, no one really paid much attention to it. And as he was in that Sunday school class, one Sunday morning the teacher looked over at him and she said, what's your name? And he said, my name's John, Johnny. She said, John, would you do me a favor? She said, when you come in here next week, she says, will you raise your hand where I know that you're here. She said, because John, if you're here next Sunday, I'll teach so much better. Never knew what she was doing. Impacted the lives of I don't know how many thousands of people by just showing kindness and love to a little child. Mm -mm -mm. And I thought about this, if this kind of impact ha had on a child, what would it do to someone who really, really is lost and needs Christ? Well, the Lord comes to this man, and he says, the, the man is telling him, basically, I've lived a blameless life. Well, we know better than that, don't we? I mean, the Lord could have raked him over the coals and said, there's none righteous, no, not one. For all of sin that comes through the glory of God, there's... None righteous, no, not one. But the Lord didn't do that. He kept talking with him. And I want you to notice that this fella, he knew. He knew what his greatest need was. Did you know what? You really don't have to labor a whole lot for people to know. We live in America. Now, if you were in Mexico or somewhere else where they'd never heard you, may, but we live in America. And I would say a lot of the people, and I'm sure there's some here that have never heard, but the majority of people that you and I are reaching have literally had some kind of taste of the gospel. They've had some kind of portion of the Word of God. Many of them are aware of what their need is. Did you know what? Sometimes people are only going to receive things if it's given in the right way. Well, bless God, they don't want to listen to me. It's their fault. Just let them die without Christ. They some like that. You know what the, the point is here is this. 
the Lord's approach to seeing these people. This man. This man thought he was special. Now, that points out a couple of things to me. He's going to be difficult to reach because he's, he's thought that everything he's done in life has been the right thing to do. And many things he had done was the right thing to do, right? But here he comes and he's talking now about eternal life. And guess what? You can't buy salvation, friend. You can't buy salvation. And so the Lord is dealing with him about how special he is. And really, to be honest with you, when you're trying to deal with somebody who's lost, this man didn't see himself a condemned sinner. When you're trying to deal with somebody who's lost and they think that there's something special and they think that God's uh, uh, going to show different favoritism to them because they've done their very best to observe, to watch on guard, if you will, the law from, from being a youth. And I believe the man had done what he... I believe he really did look at the law. He really did study the law. But you know what? He was as lost as you could be. He knew a lot of truth. And really, to be honest with you, this man's problem is found, if you will, in Matthew. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 13. In Matthew chapter 13... The Lord exposes this man's problem. In Matthew 13, verse 22, I want you to see what the Word of God has to say. He also that received among the thorns, watch this, is he that heareth the Word and the cares of this world, here it is, and the deceitfulness of riches choke the Word and it become unfruitful. Here's the problem. When you and I are trying to reach people, we don't know what they're facing. We don't know what they're up against. This man's problem was this. You ready? He loved money. And 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 10 says, The love of money is the root of all evil. This man had a problem with money, friend. He loved money. He actually had done what he could do to be a good person. He was blessed with finances. And in that time and day from the religious world, much like our Pentecostal crowd, God's favor is on you if you've got a pocket full of money. Well, I don't know where they'll ever, if they've ever read the verse over there where the foxes have holes and the bird of air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head, friend. Uh, there are, you don't have to have money to go to heaven. Matter of fact, there'll be a whole lot less uh, rich people in heaven, I personally believe, than poor people because of the very text that I read. This man not only loved money, he had a great desire to have it. He had a great desire to, 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 to have the pleasure of money and what it could be. And he literally, I personally believe, thought that the Lord, you know, he could buy his salvation. Well, it's not happening, uh-uh. He goes through all this, and I want you to notice what the Lord says to him. He said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And the Lord quotes the law to him, Exodus chapter 20. And the man looks at him, pauses, and says this. You know, Sometimes it's more difficult dealing with people who's religious than just somebody who's never really heard a whole lot. This man knew the law. He knew Jesus quoted the Ten Commandments to him. And when he, when he gets finished, the man looks at him sincere and full of pride and full of selfishness. He says, all these have I observed from my youth. Now, he thinks he's special and the Lord is going to have to treat him with special uh, treatment because he's rich, right? Mm -mm. Now watch this. This man all of his life has been focusing on the outward appearance of things. Dotting every I, crossing every T, keeping the law, having money. And you know what the Lord's going to do? He's going to refer him to what Paul was exposing in Philippians chapter 3 where Paul talked about blameless. This man literally did not have the mentality of being guilty on the inside. This man, listen, his subtle sin was exposed by the Lord. That means when you're trying to get something done in clever ways, you're trying to get something done very subtle, 
to get something done that you want. And what he was trying to do is get salvation in a subtle way. Well, the Lord didn't come out and tell him, now look, here you are, you're, you're trying to be clever with the creator of this world. He didn't tell him that. He didn't expose that. But you know what he done? He got him listening. The Lord threw the law out there, the Bible. And the man come back and he said, all this I've done for my youth. And when the right time hit, and when the right moment occurred, Jesus gave him the sobering truth of the Word of God. And that's what these people need more than what our attitudes are, more than what our thoughts are. Well, if you'd get in church, quit drinking, you'd get, maybe get right with God. Well, there's some truth to that. They don't need my opinion. They don't need me to battle them and beat them with my opinions and my thoughts. They need the Word of God. Nothing's going to bring them under conviction but the Bible. And do you know what the Lord did? This man, listen, he's not talking to a preacher. He's talking to the God of heaven. And he said, all these things I've observed stuck his uh, chest full of pride out there and trying to, he's trying to educate Jesus. And you know what the Lord tells him? He said, uh, one thing thou lackest. You want to play the Bible? You're talking to somebody that wrote it. One thing thou lackest. He said, I want you to take everything you've got and go and sell it. Give it to the poor. Take up, watch it, not your, but the cross. And follow me, and you can have eternal life. You talking about a selfish, thumb-sucking brat, buddy. Here he is. See, that's the Baptist preacher calling him that. Jesus didn't call him that. You know what he did when Christ told him that? The Bible literally said he was sad and he was grieved. Because he, had, because he had much possessions. Here the Lord told him, he said, you can, you can have eternal life. Just uh, one thing thou lackest. You forgot Exodus 20 and verse 17. Thou shalt not covet. You're guilty of covetousness. You're guilty of loving money. You're guilty of of loving the pleasure of money and the things that money possesses and the power of money. And the Lord was just, buddy, he, he had him right. But you know what he did? He didn't beat him over the head before he ever exposed his sin of covenants. You know what he done? He loved him. This man, uh, he, he, he went off and he got sad and he wept, wept bitterly. Uh, we're led, I'm kind of led to believe he didn't get right with God here. Uh, but, but one thing he did do Jesus confronted him in a loving manner that this man had to walk away and deal with the truth in his life. And here's the thing. You say, preacher, what are you preaching on? It's supposed to be a Memorial Day message. It is. Just hang on. You're going to see some of your loved ones probably tomorrow. And all year long, many of us just done nothing but complained and bickered about how they live. Why are you complaining and bickering and murmuring about how your loved ones live when they're lost? What else do you expect? Right. If they're lost and on their way to hell, they don't know any better. Now they may know to do right and wrong and I'm not going to bicker with you over that but I'm telling you there's not the seed of the word of God has not taken up root. Jesus doesn't live inside. They're on their way to hell. There's more important matters than their lying and covetousness. Jesus wasn't going to argue with him. I mean... Do you realize what the Lord could have done here? How he could have exposed this man? He could have took him to school left and right with the word of God. No, you haven't kept all the commandments. No, you've not observed them all. I mean, he could have made him look silly in front of all these men. 
But you know what he did? He loved him. I'm going to tell you my problem and yours. And you say, preacher, you speak for yourself on this matter. Christ chose a right time to confront this man when he knew the man would at least believe what he was saying. Now, whether he agreed with him or done what he said, we don't know here. But the Lord got him close enough to where he would listen to the truth of the Bible. And he looked at him and he said, one thing thou lackest. He let him talk. And Christ so sucked him in to where he would listen to Jesus. Here's my point. When are we going to realize that pointing everything out they do, they're not listening. They're getting mad. They don't want to be around you. You've corrected them all their life. Every time you're around them, you tell them how they need to do this and how they need to do that and why they need to do this. How about just spend a little time with them? I tell you, if, I, if I'd have grown up in a Christian home and I'd, I'd have got, I mean, I, I know some kids, we even Dawn and I have pastored them, and, and, and we, we'll sit back and talk and say, oh boy, they're fixing to run for the hills, buddy. It's, they're fixing to flee. The minute they get 18 or 19, they're gone and they're running and they're never turning back. And we, we have a mentality today that people are just supposed to stop sinning and do what's right. And, and it don't work that way. It doesn't work that way. And the problem is this. Do you love your loved ones enough to love them enough to confront them with the truth and love? Let me illustrate it and I'm finished. This actually happened. And it's going to have to happen again. Uh, take me off Facebook, Mar uh, Marty. And it has nothing to do with Facebook not agreeing with what.